Hi, well, it's Mark Fielding Pritchard here again from ME Fieldings. Um, we had a couple of messages from people who were looking at the infantry training that we did, said thank you very much to the infantry. Please could we go back to the leases and please could we do something a bit more basic on the leases. Um, as I think I told you with the lease training that that was part two of a series of oh, three or four of these training courses. So I decided that as we prepared the um, the slides for leases one that we would put up um, leases one. So that's what we're doing now. This is leases one. Once again, please, if you're not interested in Ipsos or you're not interested in IFRS, but you have some friends who might be interested, please pass on to them. Please subscribe. Please come onto the website. Please like us on Facebook. All that stuff. Because when you do that stuff, then what happens is is that companies come in and offer us contracts. When they offer us contracts, they say, hey, you guys are popular, what you're doing is good. And then we have more opportunity and more money and more time to do more of this free stuff. So what we're looking at, therefore, is leases once again. So what we're really looking at with this training, therefore, is what is a lease? And as it says on the slide, this will build awareness of how to account for leases and it will help participants to understand how to recognize and how to measure leases in their financial records. So let's move on to slide number two. So for those of you who are not completely sure, a lease is, and you can read this thing as well as I can, but what the hell, an agreement whereby the lessor, so the person who legally owns the asset, conveys to the lessee, so the person who's going to use the asset, that right of use. So somebody owns an asset, let's call it a crane or a photocopier, and they give someone else the right of use. In return for that right of use, as far as we're concerned at slide number two, they will receive a sum of money. So someone owns an asset, they let someone else use it, and that someone who is using it pays a sum of money. So that's what a lease actually is. And I hope that everybody kind of understands that. Right, there are two types of leases. A finance lease is, as the slide says, a finance lease substantially transfers the risks and rewards of ownership. Therefore, if you are the lessee, the person who is using the asset, what you're actually using finance leases for is you're using them as a source of finance to purchase assets. So with a finance lease, the lessee, the person who is using the photocopy, the person who is using the crane, is using this as a way of raising finance to actually take ownership of those assets. And what you do, therefore, is you rent the asset for a period of time, and the rent that you pay is equal to the purchase price, or virtually equal to the purchase price. Now, we'll come back and revisit that later. But therefore, it's a source of finance by which the lessee is really acquiring the asset. What therefore is an operating lease? Because we have these two different types. Right, an operating lease is any lease which is not a finance lease. So therefore any accounting standards which are under international standards will define what is a finance lease. If you do not meet the criteria of a finance lease, you have an operating lease. So the standard will tell you what is a finance lease. If you don't have one of those, then what you have is an operating lease by default. Right, the, the best way to think of this, or the easiest way to think of this for, for me, is to think of it uh, in terms of motor cars. Let's assume that you decide you want to buy yourself a new motor car and it's gonna be a Ford. Now, just listen to that phrase. You are deciding that you want to buy for yourself a new motor car. You go down to the local Toyota, Ford showroom, whatever, and the guy says, okay, here's the particular model that you like, Ford Focus, whatever it is that you're interested in we offer this thing which is called leasing. You will pay a certain sum of money up front, you will pay a certain sum of money every month, and then at the end of three years, you get to give that car back. If the car is not in a good, in a good um, situation, in a good way, if it's not been looked after when you come back, then there's some kind of penalties. If the mileage is greater than the agreed mileage in the lease, so if you've done more than, let's say, 30,000 miles, or you've done more than 45,000 kilometers, whatever's in the agreement, you must pay a sum of money, which is therefore the extra miles that you covered in that lease. 
Right, what's happening therefore is that this is just a, a, a fairly complicated way in which you are actually purchasing a motor car. You keep this car, you drive the thing as if it was your own. You are responsible for maintenance, you are responsible for insurance, you are responsible if the thing's in an accident. If it breaks down and it's not covered by a guarantee, then you are responsible. At the end of three years, you can either hand the thing back or there will be some kind of agreement whereby you can pay a sum of money and you can keep the thing for a fourth year, a fifth year and so on. Right, that is a finance lease. So just think in terms of your motor cars you are purchasing a motor car the lease is a tool by which you can do that and most of the cost of that motor car is borne by you the money that you pay up front plus the money that you pay every month is fundamentally the purchase price of that car now there will be some kind of residual value etc etc but basically you're buying the thing now think of the second alternative you go on holiday, you go away to wherever you want to go to, to Cyprus or Greece or America or somewhere. You're in Florida, you're in Nicosia, wherever, for a couple of weeks. While you're there, you decide to take the wife and kids out into the countryside and you hire a car for one day, two days, three days. Right, in, in legal terms, you are doing the same thing. You are renting a motor car and it is under it is yours for two or three days. Can you see, though, that when you're in Cyprus or you're in Florida or wherever it is you decided to go on holiday, there is absolutely no sense that you are purchasing that motor car. It is a standard rental agreement. You are renting the thing for two or three days whilst it fulfills some purpose, in this sense, driving you, your wife and your kids around the island or around wherever, the bay or wherever, and then you're going to hand the thing back. Right, and that is, on a theoretical level, the difference that you're looking for a finance lease, you are buying the car. In your mind, it is your car, and the lease is just a tool by which you purchase that motor car. When you're on holiday, you never think, this is my car, I own it, it's my personal belonging. It still belongs to enterprise or budget, or whoever the damn rental company is. And you give the thing back after three days. That's the difference. Now, those obviously are extreme ends of the spectrum. And what will happen in real life is there's going to be a huge amount of gray areas. And we're going to come on to those two gray areas. Just one thing, remembering that this is leases one as well. Just look at the first thing there. It says Ipsos 13 and also the IFRS standard is the same. Is an example of substance over form. What that means is that when you have a finance lease, if you are the lessee, Right, the lessee is the person who is using the assets. You are not legally the owner, okay? The lessor is the owner, you are the lessee, and you are renting. The reality of the situation is legally you are renting, but in fact you're using it to purchase that asset. Now what this means therefore, right now just deep breath for this, what this means is that if you are the lessee, we account for the assets as if you owned them. Remember, the lessor actually owns them, you are the lessee. The lessee accounts for them as if he owned them. So therefore, you take your motor car and you put it in your balance sheet, your statement of financial position, as if it were your asset, and you put the thing into your balance sheet as if you owned it. And that's what that phrase means. It's an example of substance over form. Because the legal form is that you do not own it. But the reality, the substance of the transaction, is that you are treating it as if you do. Right, for those of you who are doing ACCA, ICA, EW, ICAS, and so on, that's really important. Because that comes up in exams all the time. Okay, give us an example of substance over form. And leases is a perfect example of that. So please make sure you get that. For the lessee, we show it as our asset, but we don't own it. We do that because the reality is, is that we're going to buy this thing. And that, therefore, is an example of substance over form, a basic principle of accounting. So in slide number four, we talked very briefly about these two different types of leases. Now, if you're actually working with this, and those of you working for governments, those of you working for organizations like the, the United Nations, you actually need to go away and have a look at the standard 
It's actually very rare that I advise people to go away and read the standard. But with leases I do, because the standard for Ipsos and the IFRS standard both give you criteria. What is a finance lease? So you need to know what those criteria are. And you can actually cut and paste them into a checklist, which is pretty useful. Bear in mind, though, that our overall, our overall principle is if it's a finance lease, it will transfer the risks and rewards to the lessee. Right, remember that the lessor is the leasing company, the people who actually own it, and the lessee is the person who uses it. So you don't own it. But one of the biggest indicators that you have a finance lease is that risks and rewards are transferred to the lessee. So therefore it says here, we talk about losses from idle capacity and technical obsolescence. So therefore, the lessee, the person who is using the asset, will, will assume those risks. So losses in idle capacity, for example, I saw where we had a particular branch of a police department that leased an asset that was going to produce driving licenses. And they estimated that it would produce laminated driving licenses, something like 200 odd thousand a year, and it was actually producing less than 30,000 a year. Now what happened was, was that the value of the machine, obviously the value of the machine declined because we, we actually had the value in the machine and therefore impairment on its, on its use in, on its value in use. And so the value went down, right? That loss was borne by that police department, even though they didn't own the machine. They didn't get to send it back. They still had to keep up the payments. Technical obsolescence can work in the same way as well. Um, you would see this, for example, where the lessee is leasing, where we saw it, for example, they were leasing um, a space station. So a station which is capable of launching space rockets and satellites into space. The lessee was producing the satellites in up to date with the most relevant technology. And if the space station wasn't capable of handing that technology, then who had to keep the space station up to date so that it could keep up to date with the changing um, technology of those space items? Right, the lessee had to. So the lessee was producing the satellites and it was responsible for updating the technology in the launching station. So it bore the risks. And so therefore we had a finance lease for those particular assets out in that desert. Rewards are the same. If the value of your asset goes up, so you get some profit, some appreciation, if you have an asset, something like a photocopier, you buy it for $1 and then you can sell it for scrap or sell it to another company. Who gets that benefit? If the lessee gets the benefit, then it is very, very indicative that you have a finance lease. Okay, I hope that's clear. Overriding principle, risks and rewards are transferred from the lessor to the lessee. So the lessee runs the risk of idle capacity, the risk of technical obsolescence, and they have the chance to make some profits, some appreciation, some sales proceeds. Risk and rewards sit with the lessee. So slide number six follows on from slide number five. And again, we talked before about you know this idea of defining what is a finance lease. So these are just more conditions which are indicative that what you're dealing with is a finance lease. So therefore, if at the end of the lease period, ownership is transferred, that would almost certainly show you've got a finance lease. In most jurisdictions, you can't just transfer it. There has to be some payment. So certainly in Great Britain, we used to see the old one pound leases where there was an additional payment of one pound by the lessee. And at that point, ownership was transferred. Now, for many, many organizations, that is a compulsory payment as well. When leasing as an industry was starting in places like the former Soviet Union, we had situations where that was not a compulsory transfer of ownership. And so people in banks came to work and found their car park full of heavy digging equipment and so on because the lessees had simply sent it back because they didn't want it anymore. So that's often compulsory as well because remembering that your leasing company is going to be a bank. So what are they going to do with oil drilling equipment and so on? Um, the lessee has a bargain purchase option, so that's just really the same. Instead of one dollar or one pound, it's 50 or 100, but it's a very significantly discounted value. 
And finally, the lessee has the ability to continue the lease for a secondary period at a rate substantially lower than the market rate. Uh, the rate would be substantially lower simply because they've, in effect, already paid for the asset. So therefore, now that this second rate is just a lower rate and it just keeps the agreement going. Um, some companies like to do this. In, in the olden days, before lease accounting was introduced, companies used to do this to keep the assets off their balance sheet. So it looked as if they were being very efficient. Now they have to put them on the balance sheet. There's not a huge, a huge amount of... Um, point in doing this. Finally, the nature of the asset. The leased assets are of a specialised nature that only the lessee can use them without major modifications being made. I mean, that's true and that's not true. Um, it, you'd have to look at what the asset is. If it's a space station, then it's pretty specialised. If it's a photocopy or a motor car, it's not. So again, some of these conditions are more critical than others, if you can use that phrase. And the leased assets cannot be easily replaced. It's, it's the same point again. You know, if you, if you close down certain certain leased functions and the whole business will stop for certain assets driving license production for example others if it's a motor car who knows so you just have to use your common sense and you'll find that there will be some yeses and some no's and, and then you have to use your judgment an understanding of what's in the standard enables you to take a to take a step back and take an overview as well to give you a supportable legal position what's the lease and what's not what's a finance lease rather and what's an operating lease and this is more of the same. The lease term, if the lessee can cancel the lease, then they have to make very heavy payments to the lessor to get out of the lease. That's normal. You'd see that with motor cars and you'd see that with um, photocopiers in particular. And the lessee bears gains and losses from change in the fair value of the residual. So therefore, again, the leasing, if you're looking at a motor car, the leasing company will tell you what the residual value of the car is in let's say 30,000 miles in three years time we estimate the residual value of it will be this if the residual value is considerably lower they would look for a reason why and you have to pay that if you can show that it's your fault because it's been crashed or that you've done a lot more miles than they expected finally gains and losses the lease term is the majority of the economic life of the asset that's in the standard and at inception the present value of the minimum lease payments amounts to at least substantially all of the fair value Right. Often in leases, what will happen is, again, go back to your motor car. You have a minimum lease payment. So the minimum lease payment is the minimum amount you must pay every month. Then there will be extra fees on top for things like damage to the car, for things like extra miles, all the stuff we've already already submitted, um, submitted or discussed rather. Right. What they're saying here, therefore, is that the present value, present value, that this idea of what's the current value of the minimum lease payment, so what's the minimum amount you will pay under this lease, amounts substantially to all of the fair value. Again, it's just this idea that you're buying the thing. So therefore, even if you just pay the minimum, you're still paying the purchase price of the thing. Yeah. Um, in almost all the countries I've ever worked in as well, uh, if you have a lease, the lessor has to include in the lease a, a note of what the discount rate is, so what the effective rate of interest as well. Yeah, So you can actually do that calculation very simply in Excel because you'll know what your discount rate is. If any of you don't know how to do present value calculations, send us a message through, through the website. In slide number eight, now we get something which is kind of ipsa specific and now we're talking about nominal leases if you think about ifrs if you have a company in britain like tesco's in america like walmart they will certainly have both finance leases and operating leases but those leases are going to be at full commercial rent they're either purchasing some assets using finance leases or they're renting equipment whatever when you have governments and particularly when you have things like charities, NGOs, or United Nations, NATO, and so on, what will happen is that they may have things which are nominal leases. So let's assume United Nations, the World Food Programme, they are given a building in the middle of London for their office and the British government charges them one pound per year for the rent of that building. Right, that is a nominal lease. And that's what this whole slide is about. So we can call it peppercorn rents. A peppercorn rent just means it's much, much below the market value. 
Right, to separate out, to separate out, do you have a finance lease or do you have an operating lease? You have to go through the same process as you went before. When you've seen the items before, you will have seen that, you know, we talked about what's a finance lease, what's an operating lease, and in most cases it will not be completely black and white. You're going to have to weigh up the different criteria. You're going to have to do the same here. If the British government gives World Food Programme a lease and it's for 99 years, World Food Programme is responsible for repairs, World Food Programme is responsible for insurance, World Programme is responsible for local taxes, if not national taxes, etc, etc, it's probably still almost certainly going to be a finance lease. And in that case, World Food Programme will put that asset into the balance sheet. So they will debit the asset in the balance sheet. Now, when they debit it, they will debit it at fair value. So there's got to be a credit somewhere. And the credit, therefore, will be the fair value and it will be donation income. So we credit donation income on that building. If the British government says you can use a building but you can only use it for six months, then in that case we would probably almost certainly say it's an operating lease subject to other criteria. And in that case, what we would do is we would say, OK, well, everything goes through the income statement. Everything goes through this comprehensive statement of income. So therefore, we will take the rent. So what is the market value of the rent of this building? That will be your donation. And then you'll have a debit, which is equal to that. OK, right. We're going to look at the debits and credits relating to these things later in the series for leases. But if you have these nominal leases and you're dealing with governments, charities, um, international agencies, then you quite simply treat them like anything else. Go through your criteria. Does it have the facets? Does it look like it's a finance lease? Does it look like uh, it's uh, um, an operating lease? Okay, and this is what we call donated right of use. And donated right of use is treated the same as nominal leases, which we had on the last slide. Um, where you see this, for example, is we've had this sometimes when we've had organizations which are allowed to use an office, but the office itself changes. So they get an office for six months, and after six months they have to move, and they have to move again, and they have to move again. So the government keeps making them move and move and move. Right, in that case, because the asset isn't the same, you've almost certainly got an operating lease here. Yeah? So therefore, we would say, well, this office you used for this period of time, this office for this period of time. What's the market rent? Accumulate one year's value. And then we have credit um, donation income and, and debit some equal and opposite expense. So donated right of use is the same as a nominal lease. Except, I mean, if you actually take this according to the slides here, it says there is no payment at all. So not even one dollar. Um, most governments do require something, but it's usually very, very heavily discounted compared to market rates. Many, many, many uh, UN agencies have this. So you can have a look at UNDP's accounts and UNDP will show you how they account for donated right of use and nominal leases. OK, that was leases one. Leases two has already been posted. There is leases three and four, which I guess we'll put up over the next month or so. Thank you very much to everyone who subscribed. If you enjoyed what you've seen, please leave comments. Please like us on Facebook, blah, 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 blah. Thanks very much. If you have any questions at all, you know where we are. Please contact us through the website. Thank you.